Hello again, this is Christina Jing here from ITDP, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. Before we begin our session, there are a couple of things to note. The webinar will be recorded and both the recording and PowerPoint will be shared with you on our website and via email within two weeks. To interact with our host today, please submit questions through the Q&A function, which you can find at the top or the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please refrain from using the chat box. Again, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar titled Indicators for Sustainable Mobility. In the next hour, we will review ITDP's brand new report and interactive online tool that defines criteria to evaluate mass transportation systems in 20 cities across North America. ITDP developed a suite of 12 indicators that can be used to benchmark, benchmark sustainable mobility in cities, ranging from city characteristic indicators, such as weighted population density, to accessibility indicators, such as the percentage of jobs accessible within 60 minutes. Our presenters today are Jacob Mason and Joe Chestnut, both located at the ITDP Washington DC office in the US. Jacob Mason is the ITDP Director of Research and Impact, and also co-chair of the Urban Access Working Group for the World Bank Some for All program. He manages data collection, reporting, and evaluation for ITDP globally. He specializes in strategic research that drives a conversation about sustainable transportation and development, assessing new technologies, and identifying new quantifiable ways of meeting program goals. His leading works at ITDP include the Bike Share Planning Guide, the BRT Standard, a global high shift cycling scenario and three revolutions report in urban transport. Our second presenter today is Joe Chestnut, our transport research associate, and he works on implementing indicators to analyze organizational impact, urban growth and walkability. Prior to his work at ITDP, he was a research intern at the Brookings Institution in their Metropolitan Policy Program. He also is the author of Pedestrians First, which you can find a webinar in our past uh, in our past sessions from 2018. Now I'll hand it off to you, J Jacob and Joe. Please feel free to share your screen and start your presentation. Thanks, Christina. Uh, this is Jacob Mason um, with ITDP. I've uh, been with ITDP for about uh, six years now. Um, and I'm just gonna provide uh, some background for this work and then I'm gonna hand it off to Joe who can uh, talk in more detail uh, about the work that we did. Um, and then I'll finish up with some of the next steps and, and implications of what we did. So um, first I'd like to, to give some thanks to um, uh, the funders of this work, the Toyota Mobility Foundation, particularly was instrumental in, in us moving forward with this. Um, so why are, we, why are we looking at indicators? Um, one of the, the big challenges that we've seen in our work around the world um, is that we've done a lot of work, um, but it's hard to tell if that work is making the kind of change and leading to the kind of cities that we want to see. We may implement a BRT or a cycling network, but a, a, an urban highway may come in as well and uh, move the needle in the opposite direction. So we want to track progress um, more consistently uh, and really measure the goals that we're trying to get at, uh, such as access by sustainable modes, equity of access and uh, environmental benefits, among others. Um, previous ITDP work on indicators has included uh, measuring rapid transit. Um, we've looked at the amount of rapid transit per person at the country level. We've also looked at um, proximity to rapid transit at the city and metro level to look at uh, growth, so transit-oriented development, uh, as well as um, how effective new transit investments are at serving more people. Um, and as Christina mentioned, we've developed the pedestrians first to develop indicators to measure uh, pedestrian, uh, the quality of the pedestrian environment. Um, we're obviously not the only organization to look at uh, indicators. Um, other organizations such as the World Bank, um, many universities around the world, uh, and even the EPA have measured access um, as a way to, to look at progress in cities and, and make comparisons. Um, so what's new about I this? That, sorry, yeah. I'm just going to pause you for one moment. Uh, the slides still haven't switched yet. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you're having trouble sharing them. 
Oh, they haven't shared. Okay, let me share them really quickly. Oh, I just haven't advanced it. Is this working? No, can you uh, try just uh, pressing share all again at the bottom? Sure. sure. Apologies. Yeah. For some reason, it's still not pop popping up. All right, let me get it. Oh, there we go. Is that working? Yes, uh, you could put it in full screen now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Apologies for that. So uh, as I was saying, um, while other groups have, have done work in this area, um, I wanna talk briefly about what's new about what we've been doing. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is to bridge the gap between uh, more global means of measuring and benchmarking progress uh, at cities, particularly in a developing country versus more nuanced and accurate means of, of measuring progress that have been pioneered in the US and Europe um, and other wealthier countries. Um, in addition, we're looking at, at better measuring the importance of frequency, which has emerged lately as a, as a key um, metric of success, um, popularized by Jarrett Walker and a lot of his work. Um, we also want to look more into the ability of bikes to facilitate access um, specifically through high quality in, in, uh, infrastructure that has been shown to uh, facilitate cycling. Um, and then we want we wanna, to try to test some indicators for use in more broader um, measurement schemes, such as the sustainable development goals. Um, so with that, I'll pass it on to Joe Chestnut, um, who has been leading the actual measurement, and he can delve into a lot more of the details about what we have done, what we learned, and um, I'll let Joe take it from here. Great, thanks Jacob. Uh, <clears throat> I appreciate the introduction. Uh, and thank you to all of our attendees for attending. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive into this Indicators for Sustainable Mobility Project, um, get into some of the detail. There's gonna be a lot of information in this presentation. So we're gonna try and leave a lot of time for questions at the end. So looking forward to those and before we get going, a brief agenda. So I'll introduce the project, sort of what we measured, um, and then I'll just dive into key findings. Jacob will touch on some next steps for us, and then we'll get into that Q&A. So we developed 12 indicators for sustainable mobility and tested them and applied them in 28 cities in North America. These indicators can sort of be broadly categorized in these three categories of proximity to transit, accessibility, and city characteristics. So for proximity to transit, we measured the people, jobs, and low-income households that were near frequent transit. And then we also measured the people, jobs, and low-income households that were near rapid transit. And I'll dive in a little more on what those mean in a little bit. And then for accessibility, we measured the number of jobs that can be reached in 30 minutes and 60 minutes. Uh, we also looked at the number of what we call low skill jobs that can be reached in 30 and 60 minutes. And then we also looked at the number of people that could be reached in 60 minutes. And then for city characteristics, it's a bit of a catch all category. So that's things like block density, weighted residential density and sustainable transport mode share. So I'll go ahead and dive into some key findings. Um, the first thing I'll do is I'll highlight the two indicators that have the strongest correlation with sustainable transport mode share. Uh, the first of these is job accessibility. Uh, before I talk too much about what that indi indicator was, um, I wanted to highlight what I mean by a correlation. So a correlation shows how well two variables are associated with each other. Um, so for this work, we are associating sustainable transport mode share with the various indicators. Um, so in a correlation, you have an R squared value. You can see that 
on the screen there, I highlighted it in that red box. Um, and an R squared essentially shows how strong the correlation is. If it's closer to one, it's a stronger correlation. If it's closer to zero, it's a weaker correlation. So when it's high, that means those variables seem to be well associated with each other. We associated them with sustainable transport mode share uh, because one, it's our only indicator that really looks at behavior. And two, it's often used as a target by cities when they're working to lower emissions and want to create more sustainable environments for people. So with that, um, I'll dive into what job accessibility is. So for this, we looked at the number of jobs that you could reach in 60 minutes. And it's important to note, and I'll dive into this a little bit later, that we're looking here at the number of jobs. That was the indicator that showed up with the strongest correlation. Um, so the reason we wanted to measure job accessibility is you know, the purpose of transportation is to provide access to destinations. You know, the goal is for you to be able to get from point A to point B. And that's really what this indicator is able to measure. So it comes not too much as a surprise that this is the indicator with the strongest correlation then. The next highest indicator, or the next highest correlation was with our people near frequent transit indicator. And so to explain what we mean by near and by frequent, um, near means within about a 10 minute walk or bike ride. And then frequent transit, for us, we defined that as any stop that gets an average of five trips per hour from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. is considered frequent. So this is any type of transit. So it could be a BRT, it could be a subway, or it could be just a regular old bus. Um, as long as it meets that definition of frequent, the stop is included in our analysis. So the reason that we wanted to measure this is that frequent transit is very dependable. Um, as Jacob mentioned as in, in his introduction, Jarrett Walker has sort of popularized the importance of frequent transit he likes to say that frequency is freedom, and I very much agree with that. If you don't have to plan your trip around a bus that leaves once every hour, it becomes much easier to choose to use um, the bus and other forms of sustainable transport. And again, there's the R squared for the people near frequent transit and sustainable transport mode share. Um, and again, this is the second highest of the indicators that we looked at. So you might be wondering what frequent transit sort of looks like in a city. So I've included this map of Minneapolis that shows what their frequent transit coverage looks like. And I included Minneapolis because they did very well on this indicator. Um, and you can really see that they have strong corridors of frequent transit. And when we were looking at this and when we were analyzing our data, that's what sort of rose to the top is what, was, what the cities had that was most important for increasing this indicator. It's having really strong corridors of frequent transit. You can also see that the area in sort of the middle of the map with the highest density is covered very well in with frequent transit. And that too is sort of why they seem to do so well on this indicator. An example of a city that does a little less well on this indicator would be Dallas. And I bring this up not to pick on Dallas, but to highlight how their coverage is so different than what we saw in Minneapolis. In this, you get what I like to think of sort of as islands of frequent transit. You know, there's a stop every now and then that is served frequently, but most, there doesn't seem to be a clear corridor. Um, and that's really one of the differences we saw between cities that did well on this indicator and cities that didn't. And just to compare one last time, here's what that map of Minneapolis looks like. And you can see really strong corridors, well-defined, whereas in that Dallas example, there are just sort of spots you know, islands of frequent transit in between. And just to highlight again, how well Minneapolis is doing on this, you know, 73% of their population um, was near frequent transit. And they had a mode share, a sustainable transport mode share of 24%. Whereas Dallas with their sort of island coverage had a people near frequent transit result of 11% and only 6% on their sustainable transport mode share. So Jacob also mentioned the importance of biking and providing good biking infrastructure. So we wanted to have an indicator that showed 
how biking links uh, people to transit. And so I've, in, I've put this chart in here that shows the addition that biking added to all of the city's people near frequent transit scores. Um, and since we were just talking about Minneapolis, I thought it was important to highlight them as well because they actually had the greatest increase from biking of any of the cities that we looked at. So their, um, so their frequent transit score went up from about 64% up to 73%. And that increase of 9% is about 35,000 people. So it's a pretty significant increase in terms of who has access to frequent transit and in these cities. So we also measured the jobs that are near frequent transit. Um, and one of the interesting things we found was that there is often this large gap between cities and the percent of the jobs that were near the frequent transit and the percent of the people that were near frequent transit. Many cities had relatively high jobs near frequent transit. You can see that in the blue columns on this chart. Um, but they didn't do so well on their people near frequent transit. So if you look at these examples of San Antonio, Charlotte, Dallas, and Louisville, they all have fairly low sustainable transport mode shares, and they all have fairly low people near frequent transit. Their jobs near frequent transit aren't terrible. You know, they're at or above about 25%. But if you look at the cities that had the highest sustainable transport mode share, you know, Minneapolis, Seattle, Philadelphia, and Boston, they all had very high people near frequent transit and high jobs near frequent transit. And so this really highlights the need to be thinking about your land use in addition to your transportation. Um, cities that want to do better on this indicator could think about how they can rezone to allow for greater density along their frequent transit corridors. You know, it's, it's not enough just to have transit near jobs. It needs to be able to be near people so that people can get to the transit and then have it take them to their jobs. So we've talked a little bit about the number of jobs that are accessible. And we also mentioned that we measured the percent of jobs that are accessible. And so one of the interesting things that we found was it seems that the number of jobs that are accessible correlates better with sustainable transport mode share than the percent of jobs accessible. So the number of jobs chart is up in the top left corner of this slide. And you can see that it has a pretty strong correlation of about 0.8, but in the uh, percent of jobs that are available, the correlation is weaker. It's only about 0.4. And so both of these numbers have uses. Um, you know, the, the share of jobs, that percent number is really useful when you're comparing across cities. It's also really useful when you're comparing different types of access within a city. So if you're looking at access to jobs, you can compare that to things like access to schools or access to hospitals as a percentage wouldn't make sense to compare those with a raw number. But since we found that sustainable transport mode share correlates better with the raw number of jobs, if cities are looking at how to improve that mode share, it might make, might make more sense for them to measure the, the raw number and use that as their target instead of necessarily the sustainable transport or instead of the uh, percent. We also measured job accessibility at both 30 minutes and 60 minutes. And we found that 30 minutes tends to correlate more strongly with mode share than 60 minutes does. So again, that 30 minute chart is up here on the left side of the slide and the 60 minute chart is down on the right hand side. And so you can see again, 30 minutes has a stronger correlation as an R squared of about 0.6, whereas there's a weaker correlation um, with 60 minutes. The R squared is about point, uh, point 0.4. And so this is really interesting because you know, there was a lot of debate internally in ITDP and then also when we were workshopping these indicators with some cities over what the best time for accessibility indicators would be. Um, so we think that this sort of points towards 30 minutes being maybe a better standard for cities to measure accessibility in. It also makes some sense that 30 minutes would be a better um, standard because the average commute in the United States is about 30 minutes. And if we want transit to be competitive, we need to be measuring it with that in mind. 
So one of the other uh, proximity to transit indicators we looked at was low income households. We wanted to do this because it's a measure of equity in understanding how well our transit systems serve low income households. For us, we're defining low income as about or as a household that makes less than $20,000 a year. And that's based on the federal poverty level for a family of three. So one of the really interesting things we found is that in every city we looked at this in, low income households had better access to frequent transit than you know, all people did. The, the low income households near frequent transit indicator was higher than the people near frequent transit indicator, which was a little unexpected. Um, you know, at least before conducting this analysis, I expected the um, whole population to have a better access to frequent transit. Um, but what's a little more interesting is when you compare this to access to low-skilled jobs. So for us, we define low-skilled jobs as those that require less than a high school education. Um, and you can see in this chart, the jobs that require less than a high school education, those are the ones in the, the red on the graph. Um, the access to those jobs is lower in pretty much every city than the access to all jobs is. And so assuming that these jobs also are lower paying because they require less education, it suggests that there's some sort of spatial mismatch um, where low income households have better access to frequent transit but they, they don't have as good of access to the types of jobs that they might be working. And so this sort of highlights the need for cities to be thinking about not just you know, providing transit that goes to jobs, but thinking about how they can link populations to jobs that they might be working in and just creating more synergy within their systems and making them work better um, for all people, because if you think about it, low income households and people that have less than a high school education are likely more dependent on transit than the rest of the population. Owning a car is very expensive. There's a lot of upfront cost, And so if we can design our cities in ways that allow low income households to move around them more easily, it can alleviate a lot of burden. So we also measured access to people. And so Jacob touched on this a little bit, but ITDP primarily works not in the US, but around the world. And oftentimes data isn't readily available to, especially for things like jobs. Um, so we wanted to see if we could come up with a proxy measure for measuring access to jobs. And so we measured access to people. And what we found was that it actually does function very well as a proxy um, to access to jobs. You can see here the R squared on this chart is like above 0.8. Um, so it does seem to correlate very well. And so that helps a lot when we think about how we can take the lessons we learned from this analysis and scale them up and out into the other, or the other areas of the world that we work in where job data might not be quite as readily available. So we didn't talk a lot about specific city results. Um, if you want to, learn more about how a specific city did, you can go to the online interactive tool um, if you haven't already. The URL is down there at the bottom of the screen. Um, so you can look at how an individual city did on all of the indicators, or you can look at one indicator and compare how all the cities did across that indicator. The report is also available through this website and you can download that and get a lot more detail on the methodology and also a lot more analysis. Um, that we weren't able to fit just into the webinar. So to highlight some of the limitations of this study um, before I hand it back off to Jacob, um, the sample size is really small. Uh, we're only looking at about 20 cities in the US. Um, and so to really make stronger arguments and be more conclusive with our analysis, we need a lot more data. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, uh, especially with these correlations. And again, correlations show association between two variables, not necessarily causation. Um, mode share data is not comprehensive of all trips. Um, there are a lot of trips that are made that don't show up in that since it's only looking at trips to and from work. Um, so 
the data is a little skewed in that sense. And then finally, analysis is only as good as the data that we based it on. Um, we were basing this on GTFS data, which is you know static and on planned service. So if the planned service is not congruent with what the reality on the ground is with your transportation, then this analysis wouldn't necessarily make as much sense. That being said, we did what we could with the data that is available. And I think that the analysis has been very insightful. So to quickly just summarize all of those key points, the two indicators that correlated most strongly with mode share were people near frequent transit and access to jobs at 60 minutes. The cities that tended to do best on people near frequent transit and also the other proximity to transit indicators had strong corridors of uh, frequent transit. It wasn't you know, just sort of islands of stops that were frequent. And then also we found that there is this in most cities, there was a large gap between the jobs that were near the frequent transit and the people that were near the frequent transit. Um, then we found that the number of jobs that are accessible might be more important than the percentage in terms of how you can influence behavior. And then also that it might make more sense for cities to measure accessibility at 30 minutes than at 60 minutes. And then we found that low income households have better access to frequent transit, but low skill job access is worse um, than all skill job access, which again suggests that there's some sort of spatial mismatch between where transit near low income households goes and where the low skill jobs are located. And then finally, we found that access to people does function as a good proxy for access to jobs. Uh, which is important for how we scale this work out um, into areas of the world where job data might not be readily available. And with that, I will hand it back over to Jacob to talk about some of our next steps. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I think that's really a uh, helpful explanation of this work. Um, I think just uh, moving forward, um, one of the big things that we were looking to do and to, to think about from this analysis was, as Joe mentioned, the SDGs, um, particularly SDG 11, looking at cities um, and measuring access to uh, public transit. Um, one of the challenges in doing that, as Joe mentioned, is finding data for that. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to show that um, access to people might be a really important uh, indicator in measuring uh, accessibility in cities, um, specifically because it only requires three, three data points. You need a, a street network, you need population data, and then you need the transit network. And so two of those data points are already pretty uh, widely available at the global scale with OpenStreetMap providing a street network, um, and then a number of population uh, consolidation projects bringing together population data at the global level. So really the only thing missing is GTFS data. Um, and there's a number of initiatives already underway to measure that. So it seems like with this evidence, it shows that uh, this could be really possible, um, especially measuring it in the United States, which has some of the greatest um, some of the strongest and, and most pervasive separation of land use from uh, residential and uh, commercial and, and businesses. Um, so because the US is a bit of an outlier, if there's still a, a strong correlation between access to jobs and access to people, um, our hypothesis is that uh, it'll be an even stronger correlation in other places. Um, obviously, more, more research is needed to, to really prove that but it, it presents a, some of the first evidence to move that discussion forward. Um, the, other, the other big takeaway on this is that we have um, uh, really showed um, frequent transit and uh, the population near frequent transit as, a, as an important indicator uh, that's related to mode share. Um, and the reason why we, we're excited about that is that um, it's much easier to explain um, 
to politicians and external audiences than um, a true measure of accessibility. Um, you can say how many people are near a bus that comes every uh, 10 or 12 minutes um, in a way that's, that, that's easy to comprehend versus how many jobs can this average person access in 30 minutes by transit and walking requires a lot more mental gymnastics to wrap your head around. Um, and so by measuring things that people understand quicker, it's easier to take action on them. Um, obviously, there's some trade-offs when you have a less nuanced indicator. So the, the trick is to be careful about how, um, how we move forward with, uh, with those indicators. Um, and uh, the, the last point um, that I wanted to make as, as next steps is that, you know, one of our biggest um, motivations is to do our work using as much data that's um, free and open um, as possible. So we've tried to do that using readily accessible GTFS data, um, census data, um, uh, and population data as much as possible. Obviously, the, the work in the US um, required, especially the jobs work, required more detailed data than is available in a lot of other places. But it helped us to show that other indicators are possible for use more broadly and that, that are promising for um, being proxy indicators. So we're really trying to stay with that commitment to using um, free and openly available data to so that advocacy groups um, can have a bit of external um, uh, the ability to assess uh, progress externally without necessarily requiring, requiring government data. Obviously, more government data is always helpful for, for better measurement. Um, but the more people looking at this, we think is, is better for um, meeting the goals of more sustainable transportation in more cities. Um, so I guess I'll end there and um, send it back to you, Christina, to uh, uh, for questions. Great, thank you so much, Jacob. And if Esteban is online, I hope we answered your questions about SDGs. If you have a follow-up question, you can just enter it in the Q&A function on the top or the bottom of your screen. So we'll start off with the first question here. And for our attendees, we have ample time to do this discussion. We have about 25 minutes. So I encourage you to enter in the box now. The first question we have here is, how, how do we define sustainable means in the urban transportation sector? We talked about sustainable transport mode share throughout the indicators report, but perhaps we could give a more um, concise definition. Yeah, that's a great question and something that I think I meant to say and then forgot to. Um, for us, when we're talking about sustainable transport mode share, we mean walking, biking, or taking public transit. So that for us is what we're what we're thinking about with sustainable transport mode share. And just to add to that, our mode share numbers we're taking from um, commuting trips uh, as measured in the, the US census uh, and Canadian census. Great, thank you, Joe and Jacob. And I do wanna mention for our other report opportunities for sustainable transport in US cities, we have a key glossary in the beginning of the report that gives all these definitions, if you wanna check that out. The next question we have here is, to measure the number of jobs within 60 minutes, what did you assume as the origin of the trip? The travel time may vary depending on the trip origin. Yeah, so what we did is we measured it from the, cent from the central, excuse me, from the center point of each census tract in the city. And so we found the number that the number of jobs that each census tract could reach in 60 minutes. And then we weighed that by the population in the census tract and then came up with a weighted average for the whole city. And that's the number that you, you see in the indicator. Great, thank you, Joe. The next question here is if we could provide a guideline or a recommendation analyzing frequent transit related to ridership of public transport mode. So you, the question is asking for a guideline for measuring frequent transit. 
Um, a guideline relating frequent transit and ridership of public transport mode. So I'm not sure if we can we could provide a, necessarily a formula. I think our, our research is probably a little too preliminary for that. Um, but the general trend that we saw was that um, better access to frequent transit uh, is related to higher ridership of sustainable transport modes. Um, and so the, you know, the guideline, you know, the guidance, I would say from a policy perspective would be to uh, improve the number of people that are um, living near frequent transit. And you can do that in multiple ways. You could improve the frequency of existing transit services, especially in higher density areas. Um, and you can also target um, population growth towards areas that already have um, frequent transit service. Um, which is a, a fairly simplistic answer, but um, I think one that, that uh, gets at the, the goals that you're talking about. Great, thank you, Jacob. The next question, I'm going to bundle a few from our attendees. Can you please reiterate uh, which cities were included in your data sets um, within Canada, US, and Mexico? And if you have any recommendations on how you can apply these indicators, for example, for cities in the global south? Yeah, so I, I don't know the full list off of the top of my head of the, of the cities. There were, I believe, four in Canada, four in Mexico, and the rest were in the US. Um, if you want to look at the full list, I recommend going to the website. Um, in terms of how you could apply some of these indicators in uh, the context of the global south, I think that the indicators that rely on population data, so things like people near frequent transit and things like access to people, you can, you can measure um, in the global south if there's GTFS data. If there's not, uh, one of the other indicators we looked at um, that's in the report and on the website that we didn't talk about in this webinar was people near rapid transit. And you can measure that if you just know the location of the rapid transit stops and have population data and street data. And all of that is usually pretty readily available in cities. Um, so yeah, that would be how I'd recommend trying to apply them in the global south. And then to look for a full list of the cities, I'd recommend going uh, on the website and checking that out just because it'll be easier to process that way than having me list you know, 30 cities at you. Great, thank you, Joe. And just a follow-up question to that. Um, can you explain why for some indicators we can only apply it to certain cities and why not on others? For example, some of the challenges you may have faced in looking at the data, because we had some specific yeah. questions here on employment data and other types so perhaps providing just some clarification on that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll sort of start more broadly and talk about what our data sources were. Um, in the US, we are using the census data for population and commute data. We use GTFS data for the transit aspect. And then we used a data set called the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics data set. Um, and that is also done through the census and that has all of the job data in it. Um, in terms of some of the challenges we faced, that job data wasn't usually available um, or actually just wasn't available outside of the US and the cities we looked at. So we weren't able to do the job um, indicators. And we also had trouble with income data. So we weren't able to do the low household or low income household indicators. And then finally, um, to do the frequent transit and the accessibility indicators, we needed GTFS data. And so in the cities where GTFS data wasn't available, we weren't able to apply those indicators. And just to add to that, one of the challenges in using GTFS data um, happens frequently in cities that have multiple, or especially metropolitan areas that have multiple operators operating different services. So in a lot of US metropolitan areas, you have um, a core city that may have a transit agency and you may have other uh, surrounding jurisdictions that have their own transit services. Um, and in some places it's uh, 
quite a large number of different services that are being operated, each with their own GTFS feeds. So it's a challenge even identifying um, all of the operators that, that um, service in an area, especially at the metropolitan level. Great, thank you, Jacob and Joe. Uh, the next question here will also be bundled and that's regarding uh, including carbon footprint in the indicators. So for example, were on-road emissions from transportation taken into consideration for sustainability? A city like yeah. Minneapolis did well with frequent transit, but they're looking to see also their emissions levels for on-road cars, trucks, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, we didn't specifically look at carbon footprint for any of the indicators and we don't have a specific carbon footprint indicator. Um, but one of the things that you know, we know about sustainable transportation, about transit, about walking and biking, is that they're much better for the environment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions than any type of car use. So I think with that in mind, you know, all of the indicators are indicators of sustainable transport. Um, so I think that if cities want to lower their carbon footprint, they should increase their transit, they should increase their walking and increase their biking. Um, and I don't think that we necessarily had to look at any sort of carbon footprint indicator to know that. And just to, to add to that, um, this is less on the carbon front, but on the um, kind of a, a next steps front with relation to, to passenger vehicles, one of the, the things that we didn't measure that would be really interesting to look at is comparing um, access by transit to car access. And Joe touched on this a little bit in terms of um, the competitiveness of the 30 minute commute for transit and, and cars, but actually measuring like the number of jobs you can get um, during a, a rush hour or peak hour by car and by transit could be a really important metric of, of um, how well uh, how well used to cities uh, public transit and sustainable transit network will be relative to the car network. Great, thank you, Jacob. The next question here is um, addressing low skill jobs that were that were mentioned in the webinar and your in your report. So it's a two part question is access to people a functional proxy for access to high school grad or lower qualification jobs. And then secondly, looking at the data set, do you know whether the low skill jobs were generally more spread out or concentrated in nodes in similar ways as all jobs do? So those are both um, really good questions. <clears throat> the short answer to both of them is that we didn't look specifically at that. Um, a slightly longer answer is that I wouldn't expect access to people to function well as a proxy for access to low skill jobs. Um, again, we haven't tested it, that's just sort of my first thought. Um, and we didn't look at the sort of spatial distribution of the low skilled jobs in terms of if they were clustered in different areas or not. Um, but it would be very interesting to look at, I'm sure. And the fact that the access to low, low skilled and lower income or lower skilled jobs declined despite um, lower skilled um, populations having a generally higher access to transit indicates that they're more spread out, that those low skilled jobs are more spread out in the cities that we looked at. Um, so there's evidence that the, the low skilled jobs are, are not concentrating in the, the city centers in the places that we looked at, um, which, you know, matches anecdotal understanding and, and reports of uh, low skilled jobs spreading out from the central business districts of um, US and Canadian cities. Um, so that's not surprising, but um, where exactly those cluster and how they cluster is, is certainly something that would be interesting to study um, for future research. Um, and as Joe mentioned, um, we, I don't think we would expect the access to people to correlate as strongly with access to total jobs just because of um, them being more, I would assume they're more concentrated in, in fairly specific areas. So it's less of a general measure. Uh, but again, that's speculation. Great, thank you, Jacob and Joe. 
The next question here is, do you think last mile micromobility, for example, bike share, e-bike, scooters, et cetera, could be helpful in connecting more people to frequent transit corridors in US cities? I think that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we tried to do with our, with our indicators work here was for biking, we only included protected bike lanes because it provides safe infrastructure for people to bike to and from things. Um, and I think that that probably also applies to, to things like bike share and you know, the, the shared scooters um, in that they need to have protected infrastructure that's for them um, in order for them to function well as a first last mile connection. And just to add on to that, um, you know, e-bikes can really ex extend the uh, range of bicycle trips. There's evidence from that um, from a lot of the, the recent um, bike share companies that have introduced e-biking. The, the trips for e-bike share are significantly longer than the trips from um, traditional pedal powered um, bicycles with no e-assist. So there is certainly a, a potential for um, those to extend the trips, but as Joe mentioned, it, it seems like that would require um, either protected infrastructure, safe, safe um, streets and safe paths for people to access transit to really extend those trips um, or to make longer trips by those modes by themselves. Um, the, the jury though, I will say is still out on micro mobility or micro transit, I should say. Um, most of the studies that I've seen, and, and again, Jared Walker has written extensively on this, um, have shown very low ridership, lower than uh, the fixed route buses that they replaced. Um, so it's, it's not clear that those types of services, the micro transit in particular, are, are very effective at moving a lot of people. Um, but there may be some, they may serve a political purpose for um, reconfiguring um, bus networks to focus more on, on uh, high demand corridors to provide um, more frequent service on those corridors. Thank you, Jacob and Joe. The next question here is, do you think this model can accommodate uh, the suburban future of local neighborhood office or industrial park circulators or micro transit feeding for transit hubs with frequent service? So I'll jump in on this. Um, I don't think this study shows that those are I don't think this study really says one way or the other about those. The, the question about whether um, a lower density um, suburban development is served by sustainable transport ultimately comes down to cost. Um, you can provide frequent transit to a, a lower density area. You're just going to pay more per, per trip, um, either in terms of infrastructure um, or services. So you can, you can build a massive network of, um, of really high frequency bus networks to a very dispersed lower density areas and then have them be very um, attractive, but it's a very expensive proposition. Um, you can also imagine a, you know, a, a really uh, intense network of, of low density like cycle paths um, or an intense network of cycle paths in a low density area. But again, it's a much greater expense. And um, the question is how would they compete with um, private cars if, if those areas um, are able to, to speed up the trips by private cars effectively also. Great, thank you, Jacob. Uh, the next question here, many folks are asking about possible new indicators and would like to know your thoughts, um, such as access to health services, education services, including other indicators that integrate road safety and, and speed. If you could just provide um, some thoughts on those 
Yeah, I mean, I think that the utility of an indicator very much depends on what you're trying to understand. Uh, if you want to understand if you know access to health is distributed equally in a city, then having a health access indicator makes a lot of sense. The same thing is true of access to education. Um, those two were things that we looked at measuring, um, but we already had a lot of indicators and didn't necessarily know if we were going to be able to find the data for schools and for hospitals to be able to measure them. Um, and in terms of road safety, I think similarly, if you're trying to understand road safety, then it's important to have an indicator on it. Um, but again, we thought that we would run into some data limitations on road safety and how we could incorporate that into the model we use for these indicators. So I think that in terms of providing feedback or recommendations on indicators, it very much depends on what you're trying to measure and what the goal of your measurement is. And just to add to that, one of the things that, that you know is on our radar is are some of the access to education and healthcare. Um, and as kind of building off what Joe said, the, the measuring what exactly it is that you're accessing is also really important. So um, in terms of access to education, is it a school, any school, a high school? Um, different people in different situations have different needs in terms of what they're actually going to. Um, you know, you can you can imagine mapping out access to healthcare facilities, but some healthcare facilities are very specific targeted clinics. Other are big hospitals um, and don't provide the same level of service uh, at each one. So I think defining the terms of what you're measuring is really important in order to measure it in a way that's that's meaningful, um, and that can be quite tricky in a lot of cases. Um, so I guess I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. The next question here is, is addressing sustainable mobility in general. I'm bundling a few of the attendees' questions. So what are some of the factors used to analyze city characteristics and indicators to show that they achieve sustainable mobility? And what are some characteristics outside of geographical settings that are used to define or influence sustainable mobility? So what are the factors that define and influence sustainable mobility? Uh, sorry, I kind of reworded incorrectly. <laughs> Affect or influence sustainable, sustainable mobility. I know we defined it earlier as walking, biking, and public transit. But as we had showed different maps, perhaps there are some other characteristics that affect sustainable uh, mode share. Um, in terms of some of the like non-geographic things and things that you know we couldn't necessarily incorporate into the model. Um, I, I spoke a lot about Minneapolis and you know they've been in the news a lot lately for some of their land use um, changes. And I think that political will is very important for shaping sustainable transport in a city. Their city council um, has been <clears throat> very proactive in building bike lanes and increasing transit and now redoing their zoning to allow greater density. And so I think that type of thing, you know, much harder to measure, especially in a, the sense that these indicators were measured, um, but is I think very, very important for increasing sustainable uh, transport mode share. And there's a lot of other things that influence how people get around the city. You know, you in the US, it's not as sensitive to this, um, but in a lot, of, a lot of other places, wealth, can be a huge impact uh, influencer on the use of sustainable transportation um, in a lot of lower income countries. You know, you have huge percentages of people walking as their primary means of transportation, often very long distances in very poor conditions because um, they don't have the income to do anything else. And so it's not because the environment is particularly conducive to choosing walking as a mode of transportation, it's because there are a few other options and it's, it's out of necessity. Um, so that's important. Also, there's um, 
there are government programs that um, can subsidize unsustainable transportation. I mean, you look at fuel subsidies in a lot of countries um, can really foster uh, heavier use of um, private vehicles. But on the contrary, there are um, you know car taxes in, in several countries. There are 100% sales tax on new vehicle purchases. Um, and that can really drive down the number of cars that are, are bought in different places. Um, in Japan, there are um, requirements that you have to show that you have a, a parking space for your um, car um, in order to be given a permit to purchase it. Um, so there's a, a whole lot of, of other things that can, can impact um, people's choices on, on how to move around. And, and, you know, also there are cultural issues. There's some interesting studies coming out um, uh, about car pride and how much people value um, the idea of car ownership and how that influences their, um, their choices in terms of, of how they move around the city. Um, I think we're starting to see in the US that idea waning a bit. Um, and in other countries though, that, that idea is very strong, um, but it's still only recently something that's being measured in a quantifiable way. So the uh, outputs of, those, uh, of that research will be really interesting going forward. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have here is related to the relation between the indicators access to jobs and access to people. Um, do you think about, are, are there specific factors that you believe are related to the urban configuration or environment that might strengthen or lessen this relationship? Yeah, I think Jacob touched on this a little bit. I, you know, in the US where we were testing this, we have very segregated land use. It's, there's not a lot of mixed use development, especially as you get outside of cities into the suburbs, it's very residential and not very job heavy in a lot of places. And so I think that way, that type of situation would make that connection, that correlation weaker, um, which I think speaks to the potential of access to people being a good proxy for access to jobs because in most other countries in the world, that land use segregation is a lot lower um, Jacob, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Yeah, and you can imagine different cities have even stronger segregation of those different uses. Um, so even in the U.S., there may be areas where there's very strict segregation, but um, they adjoin or are, are sort of mixed around in a kind of scattershot way. Whereas in other cities, you could imagine an entire a massive swath of a city being strictly for industrial or commercial and then another massive swath being strictly for residential. And so that would that would show a weaker correlation or a weaker connection between those two. So the layout of the city can really influence that strongly um, in my perspective. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. So we actually only have one minute left of the webinar and I see that there were still uh, many questions entered. So thank you to our attendees. Regarding specific questions on methodology, I highly encourage you to check out the website and the report where it details how the indicators were calculated. And I think there you can find most of your answers. So again, this will conclude our webinar today. And I'd like to thank our hosts, Jacob and Joe for their great presentation. And as mentioned earlier for our attendees, this webinar recording and PowerPoint will be, will be made available to you online and via email. If you have any questions in the meantime, you can please feel free to email me at christina.jang at itdp.org. And also Joe and Jacob have um, graciously shared their contact information on the screen if you have any specific information, uh, specific information or questions on their indicator work. So thank you all again for attending our webinar today and we hope to see you again online soon. Thank you.